Hello, everyone, and welcome to the general FTU. I'm proposing that I don't share my screen uh, because there's not a lot of context on the slides anyway. Um, the, um, the things I talk about are in there. Uh, first, the engineering engagement survey. Uh, one comment there was, I have a clear understanding of GitLab company objectives, but I would also appreciate more explanation on why company has objectives like this. For example, why is auto DevOps important, even though it's almost impossible to get it right? This is very ambitious and a risky direction. Uh, I think that's an awesome question. Uh, so I'll try to answer that. And I really appreciate people asking additional questions or um, arguing with, uh, with what I'm saying. Um, so with GitLab, we, we went from just version control to doing both dev and ops. And what we're seeing in, in the DevOps world is that there's an explosion of the amount of projects that companies have due to uh, the rise of microservices. And that for each project, you need more and more tools it's no longer enough to just have some code under version control. No, you also need tests and you need to check the quality and you need to have a linter and you need to store your secrets and on and on and on. There's so much things you need to run a successful project. You need running a project without monitoring and error logging and without measuring the response time in the client. It doesn't make sense. All these things should work and it can't, What's happening now in the whole world is that people start a project and as it gets more popular, they add more and more things. But that's becoming less and less acceptable. If you have an application that consists of 10 microservices, it's not that you can say, oh, well, let's add logging as one of the microservices becomes bigger or when there's a problem. No, when there's a problem, you need the right information immediately. You need the metrics, you need the tracing, you need the logging. It's not like measuring response times is optional because a lack of response time in your microservice might, might affect another application or the, uh, another service or the application as a whole. So you need to set up these, these tens or the, these tens and tens of tools for every application. That is just too much work. So with other DevOps, we wanna, wanna prevent that. Now, are we there yet? No, like auto DevOps, even Dimitri can't use it right now because it doesn't do database migrations. So we're gonna solve that. It doesn't even do HTTPS automatically. So we're gonna solve that. There will be lots of other things to solve. But the end goal is to make sure that we can run gitlab.com with auto DevOps. So all the different services that compose gitlab.com should be deployable via auto DevOps. And that's gonna take us a year to get there and maybe even more than a year. I'm not sure it will be done by the end of 2019. What I do know is next year we'll have a couple of services on there, like version.kitlab.com and other things. And we'll keep pushing to have more and more services on there. And that is the future because otherwise this, this is what every company needs. Like in all the companies, people are creating more services and it's just, it's breaking down. It's too much work. There's some reports uh, that say that and enterprise companies, some programmers are programming only four hours per week, not per day, four hours per week. The rest is filled with meetings, with, with toil. Uh, we've seen companies where um, you have to, there's, there's like a, a process to deploy something that's so long it didn't fit on a, a single wall. Like it had to wrap almost around the corner. It was 27 steps, some steps consisted of seven different service now tickets. That's, that's what we get, have to solve. We're in a unique position to solve it because GitLab is an opinionated product, uh, an opinionated application. We have, we know what you're deploying. We know how it works. We know where the logging will be, et cetera. So we should, we should help. And that's why auto DevOps is important. Ralph, you want to verbalize your comment? Can certainly do that. Uh, the explosion of, of projects simply means that you you want to have pipelines for all of them. But whoever 
set up a pipeline with kind of gluing all the tools together, we'll have figured out that it's a complex uh, thing to accomplish. And, and therefore, Auto DevOps gets you from zero to at least one pipeline in almost no time. So that's the value of it. Yeah, there, there, there will be customizations, but over time it should be less and less. And if you follow best practices, even for complex apps like GitLab, you shouldn't need any. Still have ways to go. Like I'm super looking forward to multi-project pipelines uh, doing that better. Brendan, you want to verbalize your comment? Yeah, I just had a little uh, flashback, not a positive flashback to, you know, the last job that I had, um, I got hired to as the first kind of director of DevOps for a, a government contractor and for this federal government program that brought together three contractors and 15 unique apps. Uh, there was like a, like a 15 page word document on for each deploy, um, you know, copying this jar there, moving this thing over there, making sure this setting is correct. Uh, so I was just saying that that is the real world and uh, a problem that, is not easy to solve, but but one that we should, I, I think it's ambitious of us, but important for us to be focused on solving. Yep, and and actually the, the, the number of steps are just going up and up and up. The, the only thing we can do is automate the steps. So make sure it's not humans, not humans who have to check the metrics, not humans who have to revert it, but the complexity uh, will be there. And, and what we demand of apps uh, is going is going up. So So complexity will only keep Growing. Love the green screen, by the way. Uh, nice pop up one. Cool. Um, another thing I care a lot about is the importance of velocity. Um, and um, Eric made a nice uh, commit to the handbook, which I, uh, which I love. We We are unique in that we can outship the rest of the industry, and that's our most important competitive advantage. Um, we're open core, so we can we can incorporate other people's contributions and not slow down. Um, but that will be a constant struggle as we add more and more teams like for example we added a quality team and they've done mac and team has done a great job like gitlab.com is so much more reliable the application as a whole has so much higher quality but frequently the burden is on the developer shipping new features to make sure that they pass all the gates so as we grow it's very natural for companies to slow down to get focused more at all these other things that we also have to do so the thing I'll keep doing and product will keep doing and engineering will keep doing is keep pressing on the importance of velocity and finding what the bottlenecks are and uh, solving them. And it's important because I've seen a company slow down. If companies really reduce their shipping rate, it's almost impossible to get back up again. It's what we're doing now is almost unnatural. A natural thing is to slow down. And if you go back to a natural state of everyone doing too big of a thing, not iterating, not shipping frequently, the natural state will be that, and it will be it will be very hard to get ramped back up again. So that's why we never have like a bug fixing release, because if you lose that pressure for to 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 move people ahead to ship new things. It, it will never come back and you'll stay at that stage for the, for the rest of your company. Uh, John had a comment. I think it's about the previous thing, but John, want to chime in? John May? Sure, Sid. Um, just wanted to say that, you know, we're starting to see this, this impact. Yes, it's getting crazier, but, you know, one of our, one of our customers uh, um, just said the other day, and they're presenting on this, in Atlanta for us, but they were talking about how they use GitLab to just make all that chaos go away and, and automate things. And now they're actually moving things to, to conversational development. They've kind of gone away from what Jira is doing and they're bringing everything to the merge request because things move so fast inside GitLab 
but they, they that's the point where people come together. So what you talked about really about a year and a half, two years ago, about conversational development was right on because that's exactly what people are seeing. It's a paradigm shift on how they process things. Um, I have another customer that uh, very, very large customer that said, hey, we went from two week releases to six times a day. Now we're on a mission to go to 20 minutes. That is what conversational development is all about. And making customers do that, the only way you can do that is to simplify. And we're doing that well. So good job. We're getting there. Great job, team. Awesome. Yeah, and I think I think with concurrent DevOps, although it's new to us and it doesn't feel comfy yet, I think we'll see that we're spot on about people not not we can't afford to just hand it over, over like a baton. People have to work concurrently. And I think, I think we'll see over time that that, that, that message will start resonating. Um, Joshua, uh, you want to verbalize it? Yeah, sure. I was just going to share uh, some experience. Um, my last company actually, um, where, uh, we were pretty successful. We had a user base grow. Um, uh, we were shipping pretty fast. Um, but as we grew, as the user base grew, we, we heard the feedback as GitLab does that things are sort of breaking here and there. And, um, you know, maybe consider taking a longer time to, 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 to ship things and to take more care. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think the easy answer is to, to say yes and, and to maybe slow things down, have longer cycles, more testing. Um, and the harder answer is to really look and see, you know, how you can address those concerns without losing your velocity and what you need to do to invest in the process and the automation. Um, but, um, you know, we slowed down and, and, uh, it, it was, it was really not fun. Um, and, and we, and that ball just keeps on rolling and it's so hard to try and to try and recover. Um, so, um, there's always like rash, totally rational reasons to go slower. Um, but you, it, you really need to take a hard look and invest and, uh, figure out how you can avoid doing that while still meeting the other, obviously, customer goals you have. Uh, so yeah. I just thought I would share that. Nugget. Thanks, Josh. And look, it's uh, from the start of GitLab, the very start, we, people argue that we should have a two monthly release cycle. Uh, but I'll never, that will never have a ship as much as we do now. So the shorter we can get things, the better. And sometimes it's really encouraging to see a conversation. For example, we had a conversation about feature flags. And at one point it was going, in my opinion, the wrong way, where every new feature would need to be a feature flag. That would mean that first you have a release with a feature flag in it, and then the next release you deploy it, and then you remove the feature flag. It's a lot of extra overhead for every feature we ship. Um, so that was meant slowing down, which is not great. We should have feature flags, but only for things that are likely to break. And then we started thinking a bit more uh, about it, and someone proposed, and feature flags can be used to ship things after our merge request window or after our merge window, after the seventh or the eighth, when we're no longer merging, a feature flag can be used to ship something that you're not totally sure about. Um, but with feature flags, you can at least turn it off if it's needed. So instead of going slower, we would be able to go faster. And I think that was a great, great turnaround. Um, there's a, Comment from Lucas. You want to verbalize your question, Lucas? Yeah, I mean, there was an exciting announcement by Sourcecraft that they are open sourcing their software. So I wanted to ask when we uh, are going to incorporate uh, Sourcecraft into GitLab. Or, um, but it seems like I have to read up on Hacker News and uh, read your comments and the comments of Sourcecraft CEO. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, Sourcegraph uh, just announced they're open sourcing it. Um, Sourcegraph is a code navigation tool. So it looks into probably the abstract syntax tree of the code, understands the code, and allows you to navigate between it. And it's the, there's a couple of startups that do this. Uh, I think Sourcegraph is the best product on the market right now, as far as I can tell. Uh, and they have an, a protocol, a language server protocol, uh, that I think they contributed to. Um, which allows you to plug it in anywhere. I think it's really an amazing product. I think it's great that they open source it. It's great that they choose the Apache license instead of like AGPL and going for a dual licensing strategy. Uh, this means that we can ship it as part of GitLab. And I think it will make developers more productive. 
Uh, there's a Monaco uh, plugin for it, so we can add it to the web IDE. But I think the really interesting thing is to add it also to our code navigation. So when you navigate to a repo, you look at a file that all these uh, these pop-ups are available. People that I've talked to, to that use, for example, browser plugins to achieve the same effect, where most of them were enthusiastic about it. Um, so it seems that it's a big value add, and it's amazing that they're open sourcing all this uh, this value. Um, so I think it should be something that we have in every version of GitLab uh, for everyone, and it will make a, a huge difference. So I'm really excited about that. Apart from that, the CEO Quinn is also a great person, and and I I'm if I squint between my eyes a bit, I think I detect a few uh, inspirations. Uh, that, that GitLab gave them to, uh, to do this. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's great. It's, it might be the power of open source that gets their product more distribution this way. Very excited uh, for this. Cool, uh, slide five is about ubiquitous language. Um, you'll see me um, talking frequently when you see me um, um, arguing for something it might be that I want to want to standardize on terms. I want to define terms. And that's because as a company goes, communication gets harder. There's more concepts in the organization floating around. Um, and the hard thing is just understanding each other. And when you have one word that means multiple things, it's going to generate confusion. And when you have really long words that explain things, people are gonna use part of that explanation, a part of those multiple words, and then not have something clearly defined. And I've seen it and it's super wasteful, it's unnecessary. So as, a, as, as our management and leadership, we gotta make sure that we have ubiquitous language, that things have a, a definition that's clear, that is, um, mutually exclusive, that is comprehensive. And um, many times you'll, you'll see me uh, either trying to make search a definition or try to enforce it. And uh, sometimes it's things where you can argue how, how important is it? What's the difference between a team and a group and a company and GitLabers? I think it's important to have those things straight that when you talk about your team, it's always clear it's the team where you belong to with a common uh, with a common manager, and that we talk about a group, it's something else. It can be a stage group, it can be a director group, etc. When we talk about GitLabers, it's people, all the people at the company. Talk about the wider community, it's the people not working at the company but part of the GitLab community, etc. Um, number six is uh, why, if something is in the handbook, is when you change it, you go to the handbook first. But before that, James has a remark. James, want to verbalize it? Uh, yeah, I was just saying there is a cost of these well-defined words um, that when there's a more general word, you can say, oh, yeah, my team is doing this. And you can have a conversation where you're thinking about something else. Um, the well-defined words mean you have to kind of stop and say, my function was doing this and kind of interrupt, interrupt yourself to, to use a specific word. So I'm kind of... Um, I, I kind of dislike these and I'm the same with grammar though. So I'm probably not everyone. Like I prefer it when there isn't a rule and you could just say what communicates most clearly rather than most precisely. Yep. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. It's, it's, and it's, it's, uh, accurate. Um, for example, with teams and groups, I think we tried something else be first and it was so unnatural that, um, Martin, uh, said, look, I tried this and it's not working. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. If people actually try something and it's not working, great, let's change it. Um, and maybe team is one of those things where we should not try to pin it down because it's a general word. But in that case, we just retire it from our, from our official vocabulary. And every time you use team, people know it's ambiguous and it can mean anything. And but then group is defined and then we need to find another word for team. I really tried to do that. I couldn't find one. So if you have one, great. I'm open to changing it so you can use team fr freely. And that's some, some of the words we just kind of give up on. Like they're, they're so ambiguous. 
when I forget the definition right. And about like the brain damage you kind of incur while trying to think about these definitions, it becomes more important as the company grows because every piece of communication will reach a bigger audience. So as the company gets bigger, there's more of a burden on you as a writer to make sure you clearly express your thoughts. If you're with a group of seven people, yeah, the burden should be both on the writer and the reader. As the company gets bigger, it should be bigger and a communication is read by like 100 people, 1,000 people, there's more burden on the writer to clearly express their thoughts. So it's different if you're calling with one person. I'll care less about the definitions. If it's a team call, you're addressing the entire company, there be more enforcement of the definitions. You want, if, James, if you want to respond, then feel free. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And especially the thing about um, being more flexible in sm smaller groups. Yep. And uh, feel free to call me out on that. Like, say, this is a small group. Don't, don't be, uh, don't focus on that too much. Uh, number s slide number seven, Atlassian's new terms, they forbid uh, benchmarking. Um, apparently, uh, Atlassian doesn't like when people benchmark their tools and publish about it. Uh, I don't think this should be GitLab's policy. Uh, we like people benchmarking, and I encourage people to read that Hacker News thread uh, because there's some, uh, some great information about how people perceive Atlassian's products uh, in that uh, in that thread. And uh, Jamie was kind enough to, on Monday, immediately change our terms and we now explicitly allow benchmarking, which I think probably makes us the first company in the world to do that. It wasn't, wasn't needed strictly, but we wanted to make a point. And go okay. ahead, Ashish. Um, I know we are going to tweet about it. I saw your Slack but I think we should think about how to get that word out even stronger. It's a differentiator from other companies from a marketing perspective. So we're happy to discuss that, but I think everybody should retweet um, the tweet that will go out on the benchmarking ability. Um, but I think we need to look a little bit more on how do we spread this word a little bit wider. Well, Ashish, it's called uh, everyone can contribute. So feel free to write yep. a blog post. All the materials is Absolutely. there. All the links are there. So uh, just, just get a blog post out. The tweet is uh, here. It already went out 19 hours ago. Yep. Quick suggestion on this. Do we also um, want to just request that people publish those and how they did them? So one of the things that always comes up with benchmarking is what you did and how you did it. So not that it's required, but perhaps we ask, hey, if you benchmark, please make sure you publish how it's, how you re replicate this, right? Like, please, please give these details so that everyone else can follow up with you. Some, I doubt we'd get anyone playing that game necessarily with us, but that's historically always an issue around benchmarking. So it yeah. might be worth us just being clear on that if we can. Yeah, I've, I think that's valid. It's, I think it's like security vulnerabilities. Like you can't disclose them without giving us notice it's your legal right to do so, but please don't. Please give us notice so we can, we can prepare uh, mitigation for, for, for everyone else. I think it's the same here. I think since this is a confusing situation, I think right now saying we would prefer if you publish uh, how to reproduce your results, I think that would lead to confusion. And these, these things are confusing. For example, the first iteration of Jamie was to forbid benchmarking because that's what people naturally do. So I think in order to have clear communicate, like a clear statement about this is just to allow it and not to put the burden on anyone. If we see a proliferation of benchmarking that is not reproducible, we can always say, hey, great, if you publish benchmarks, you're not required to, but please do make them reproducible. I do think um, in, in programming, in developer tools, people tend to be way better about this than in some other uh, branches of software that I've seen benchmarking. Like there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in, I don't know, database benchmarks or stuff like that. But I, I think the, I think it's getting to a point where you have to have a reproducible um, test suite and uh, things like the Call Me Maybe series about databases, like the reproducibility of that is just amazing. And um, 
I, I think that you, you almost look a bit silly if you have a benchmark that, that doesn't produce and people will call you out. So I don't think, I don't think we have to say that. I think we just say, hey, we, we do allow benchmarking and publishing them. Oh, Paul chimed in with Quake versus Quake. If you renamed the binary, then uh, it ran different and things like that. And, and benchmarking so far hasn't been a problem for us. Every time there hasn't been a lot of benchmarks and every time someone found something, like we should just improve it. I can tell you right now what GitLab is not doing right. We use too much memory. We should go, Gitterly should not load the complete rails and we're solving that in Gitterly 1.1. We need a multi-threaded application service so we don't consume that much memory. Uh, however, our response timings, like the timing of a request, are greatly improved, especially around merge requests, because that's now uh, uh, no longer all server dependent. It's a proper view app, and those timings are way down, like first pains and things like that are much, much better than a year ago, which is very important. Number eight, um, yeah, that was just a fun thing I saw. Um, Chaos engineering or failure injection testing seems to be taking off. I think it's another thing that it's kind of hard to set up unless you would use other DevOps, in which case we can do a lot to make it uh, work out of the box. We're 27 minutes. I thought this was really fun. I think this uh, general FGU was an example of everyone can contribute. Thanks everyone for leaving comments and then uh, speaking, speaking up when asked to verbalize them. Appreciate that. I'm glad to see it doesn't lead to a reduction in the people commenting in the chat. So. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.